Dear God in heaven, we thank you for the blessings of this camp meeting. I pray that as we look at these lines, that you will give us greater understanding. Please help us and send your Holy Spirit to guide us. We're grateful for all the messages of you have given us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So the presentation I'm about to give uh, is, is not necessarily going to make conclusions. It's more making some observ observations. Uh, from two perspectives. One from our standard reform lines that we all know. Uh, and the other perspective from the lines of revolutions. Now, there's many things I'm not going to go into, like the history of the revolutions. It's going to require some pre-knowledge and I'm not going to justify why we can use the revolutions. Hmm. There's many presentations that can do that for us. So I'll begin by explaining what I've done here. Many people in the movement have been aware for some time that at the completion of the priest's line and before the Sunday law, we have two minor way marks. And they're seen on the lines of the uh, Levites and the Nethanims. As I've shown on the artwork here. Now, I've just for so it's easier, I've just translated those up into here so we can see it on the 144,000 line. So what I've done, I've essentially cut this bit and I've placed it down at the end of the revolutions. So that's an explanation of what I've done here. So we have all the revolutions, the end of the revolutions, and then I've plugged in the next step to the Sunday law. So we'll park that and now we'll talk about the revolutions. <laughs> what does the revolutions teach us? Simply, it's about America. I'll transfer, uh, transferring from a republic or a democracy to a dictatorship. What the revolutions help us do is it helps us track that progress.
and it happens in two parts. The first part here to here, 2001 to 2019, whereby the establishment is uh, um, defeated and a new uh, government rises up with a dictator. Now, the US has strong institutions. We talked about institutions this morning with Elder Palmy in this presentation. Those institutions have to be neutralized to bring in something like a Sunday law over here. So there must be a restructuring of the executive, judicial and legislative branches. Just like how Vladimir Putin restructured Russia into a dictatorship. So the best way a country can go from a dictatorship to a democracy or a democracy to a dictatorship is via a civil war or a revolution. Because it's very difficult to, uh, to change institutions. You need a, a high level of activism and energy to complete that task of taking down institutions. So the revolutions happen in two parts. I've already explained the first. And once this new government is established and a dictator in place, we have a counter-revolution that wants to fight against that new government. Now, I'm not going to go through all the history here, but essentially, if we go back to the lines of revolutions... The original monarchies or governments, depending on the revolution, was overthrown on November 9 or November 8. And the new government rises with the new uh, dictator in place. So how does a revolution begin? To begin a revolution, the country needs to be polarised. They sort of talk past each other and they don't understand each other and they start fighting. In 2001, the terror attacks at 9-11 kicked off a chain of events that led to the Iraq war. And that was a very polarizing issue. wasn't the only thing that polarised the country at that moment.
Fox News, they had a 24-hour cycle going. And what it did, it changed news from something that educates to something that entertains. And sensationalizes. And it did something more than that. It then turned into propaganda machine for the right wing cause. So these are the, some of the reasons why the country began to be polarised at the beginning, 2001 onwards. And then you get to a, a turning point or a midpoint, 2014. And there's quite a few, lots of events that this movement knows about. In this context, the prominent ones are because remember, this is a turning point. So now all of a sudden, one side is going to start winning. Mitch McConnell blocks Obama's judges. not just in the Supreme Court, but all the lower courts as well. Uh, Stephen Miller, Jeff Sessions and Steve Bannon. They create a plan to purge the centrist Republicans. They're the ones that can actually talk to the Democrats to get things done. We don't want them. Another example that turned uh, the war in the favour of Republicans was the Hobby Lobby case and what that did, it redefines religious freedom in a dangerous way. So these, amongst other things, cause the turning point where Republicans start winning. That leads to the overthrow of the establishment and a dictator rises. Okay. Maybe I'll give an example of what happened in one of these histories. Um, just so we can follow a history to give a, a, a typified example down here. So whether it's the German or Russian, they're very similar. Let's stay with the German. Uh, everyone, the public is sick of world, the, the World War One. They're not happy because of the bad treatment from the monarchy. So they overthrow the monarchy and the Kaiser advocates.
and the Weimar Republic takes its place on November 9, 1918. So we could go to the French Revolution as another example. Um, Jacobins are overthrown and Robespierre is killed. And then we have the Paris Commune um, that takes over from the Jacobins. That's that's the successive government. So then we have a period of quiet or preparation, or maybe not quiet. And then we have the beginning of the counter-revolution. So do a bit more board work now. If I grab the line of the priests, say here to here, actually there, that's what I meant to say. That's the harvest. So I'm going to just... Pretend this is a 3D model, but I'll just draw it below it. So I'll grab that bit there and just put it there. So we have a Boston, Concord, Exeter, and a test. So we know that 2020 is Concord. Or we could arrive that in a different way, if you like. I could say... Use this model where we split 2520 into two 1260s. but I'll do that with the 490. And I'll do 245. So if I go 2020, and go back 245 years. Brings me to 1775, which was the beginning of the American Revolution at Lexington and Concord, where the shot was heard all around the world. So I'm hoping you can see that 2020 is Concord and the beginning of the revolution. Clear some space. Okay. So Lexington and Concord was the shot fired that caused the people to unite in Concord against the British. So this happened in our time on May 25th, 2020.
uh, most of us should be aware that this was the first time, um, well, it wasn't, this was the death of George Floyd here. Um, this wasn't the first time that um, something like this had happened in America. There was many, much abuse, many deaths before this. But this is the first time that happened that caused the people to unite and come into Concord. and fight against the dictatorship that came to power here. The words, I can't breathe, went worldwide. And that was the shot that was heard around the world. It united an, a movement that started to fight against Donald Trump's new government. Okay. So we know this is Concord, but it's all but it's also a death decree. Um, we see four deaths in this history. John Lewis, Chadrick Bozeman, Chadrick Bozeman, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Helen Reddy. Um, John Lewis was a giant of the civil rights movement. And along with Chadrick Bozeman, they're champions of racial rights. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a giant of women's rights and LGBT rights. And Helen Reddy's music was the anthem of second wave feminism. So we've got two people from government, the legislative and judicial branches. and two people from the entertainment industry, movies and music. So we can look at this history from two perspectives. The first perspective we'll say is good. what it did during the history of a counter-revolution for equality agitates and refocuses the public time and time again onto subjects of equality. The media lays it in on their lives, their legacy, and what they've done in their life's work.
it kept reminding the world of equality from different perspectives. Perspective number two. So we'll say that's okay, but perspective number two. As the world loses these giants or symbols of equality, in the middle of a counter-revolution, which is a fight for equality, It's not good to lose the conscience of Congress. In John Lewis. Or it's not good to lose Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is known for her dissent and her perpetual arguments and fight for equality. The loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg turned the Supreme Court from a centre-right to a far-right Supreme Court. Irreparable damage to the counter-revolution. So the loss of these people are bad. Bad for this movement, fighting for equality against this dictatorship. Helen Reddy, the last person in this group, She passed away on September 29. Twenty twenty. This coincided with the first presidential debate. Donald Trump is under enormous pressure from this counter-revolution. He's getting pressure from Black Lives, Black Lives Matter. The Me Too movement. And he got COVID a couple of days beforehand. He got COVID-19 two days before. So he's under enorm enormous pressure and wants to display strength in this debate. And when asked to condemn the Proud Boys or white supremacy, uh, he said, stand back and stand by. Now, the Proud Boys slogan is Western chauvinism. Uh, this is uh, regional chauvinists, which is nationalistic, which is racism. Also chauvinism towards women, which is more of the standard understanding we're aware of. And we know the Proud Boys are renowned transphobic, transphobics. So 
So Stand Back, Stand By was a global call to anyone who agrees with those ideals. Those who believe or are even sympathetic to those positions. If I could put it simply in this context, it's a call to attack the counter-revolution. And we've seen the subject of equality attacked relentlessly. Critical race theory, trans women's in sports. LGBTQ books in schools. Or their libraries. Diversity, equity, inclusion programs for government, businesses and universities. Have been attacked. Even treating people with equality, they were being attacked by being labelled woke. So why does it feel like the right wing has an oversized influence? In politics, in local government. And in some parts of America on their school boards. an oversized influence compared to the numbers that they are. Which brings us to the end of the counter-revolution. So this study on revolutions is what in World War Three. If you go to World War II, there is an Eastern Front and a Western Front. That's right. The Eastern Front is United States versus Russia in the application. What's the Western Front? Anyone remember what the Western Front is? Yeah, Trump versus the three branches of government or the allies. <laughs> or we'll say or we'll say United States versus United States. So what do we call that? That's right, civil war, revolution. So can you see that the revolutions are the Western Front uh, in World War Three? Okay. It's a bit more it's a bit more complicated than that. Um but we'll stick with that for now. So we go back to World War II and the Western Front. We 
when does the Western Front end? So back then you've got Germany and they're facing two fronts, the Allies and Russia. So the Western Front ends at the same time as the Eastern Front. Okay, so we're clear okay so far? When does the Eastern Front end? When does Russia get a deadly wound? We've got a taker of Sunday law. When's Russia receive a deadly wound? Sorry, I missed that. Twenty twenty one. Okay. So Russia gets a deadly wound at 2021. When does it die? Okay. But that's only the Eastern Front. What about the Western Front? So the Western Front gets a deadly wound and a death. So I want to be clear here. I want to say this plainly. The counter-revolution gets a deadly wound at 2021. Essentially, the counter-revolution that has been fighting against the Trump dictatorship It gets a deadly wound and seals it, its fate in concrete. Does that mean the polarisation stops? They're still fighting. They're still arguing. It will continue right through to the Sunday war. And I'm not suggesting it stops there either. But the fate of the counter-revolution is sealed here. It fails. So I, I did this presentation to just bring us back to the, the lines that we all... Uh, love and want to learn the best we can. And I hope it triggers a conversation or helps us go back to these lines to explain where we are. I want to give an example of perhaps something that you could look at. So the counter-revolution has ended. Uh, I'll say defeated. I won't say ended. Um. I guess what I want to do is maybe let's have a look at some of these other revolutions. How does those counter-revolutions end?
So let's maybe have a look at the German Revolution as an example. Um, so at the end of the monarchy, the Kaiser, there are many voices and many ideas on how we should run and operate this government moving forward. The Weimar Republic was uh, formed by the Constituent Assembly. And the Spartacist uprising, which was the counter-revolution, they rose up in opposition. So they're the communists, um, more Bolshevik uh, communist side rising up. But I want to make a point here. We're talking about the centre left and the far left. The centre left and the far left are fighting. And so the Spartacists got um, squashed here, around here. And there was an up, another uprising in Bavaria in May. And it was, again, um, the communist, uh, Leninist, Bolsheviks um, rising up. or the far left, far, far left. And the white army or the capitalist Democrats are in a way were the center left. They defeated that red army. So the Bolsheviks, uh, the communism um, was defeated here that ended the counter-revolution. So they, these are complicated histories. But what we have here is polarisation on the left, arguing. And that polarisation because they couldn't talk to each other, enabled Nazi Germany to rise in the rise of Hitler. So I'll, I'll read a quote, it's only short. So the hostilities, uh, hostility existed throughout Germany. This hostility meaning between the centre left and the far left. It existed throughout Germany and prevented coalition talks between both parties. in order to keep the Nazi party from taking power in 1933. The division also outlived Nazism. and continue to divide the German left until a peaceful revolution.
that led to the collapse of the Marxist-Leninist government. of the German Democratic Republic in October 1989. So I'll summarise what that all said. So the centre-left and the far-left They are so polarised that it enables the rise of the Nazis in Hitler. What does that remind you of? We're, we're here, we're thinking about this history, remember. Reminds me of Vespers. <laughs> Sounds like the left has problems and they've dropped the ball. Because the polarisation has allowed the rise of the Nazis and Hitler. If we... So that's an example of... Assessing the history of our lines. We could have a look, how does the French Revolution end? There was a coup within a coup. And Napoleon seized power and became dictator. Maybe I won't use the word coup and I'll just say insurrection. So there's little gems in the revolutions along with every other line that we've been taught. Okay, so I guess these histories will give us information about the history between 2020 and 2021. So the counter-revolution has failed in 2021. Here we are. This dictatorship has given a deadly wound to the advocates of equality, to those movements. So what would we be expected to see now? So remember, we've got Black Lives Matter, we've got the Me Too movement, we've got advocate. These are movements um, fighting for civil rights and women's rights and LGBTQ rights. From here on, we should start seeing accelerated attacks against human rights. Right. I'm just going to pick one example through that history that everyone should remember. I just want to remind everyone the polarisation clearly doesn't stop. They're still fighting. Can anyone remember can anyone remember something that's significant that was global that exposed 
society and culture for where they're at. So I'm going to give you the answer. 11th of April, 2022 to 1st of June, 2022. The Depp versus Heard trial. Depp versus Heard. So Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. So what did that expose? On a society level or a cultural level? How many people were on Johnny Depp's side? How many people are on Amber Heard's side? A, a tiny minority. The numbers on Johnny Depp's support team were staggering. It was a global phenomenon. So globally... Society and culture took down women's human rights on that day or that it exposed. Feminism was there and assessed. And society on a large scale said domestic sexual violence was authorised. So culture and society as a whole predominantly decided that some human rights are not as important as others. I'm focusing on the trial by people here. As they were looking in. There's not too many bigger events that remove the voice of women. Um, it basically, it said if you want to speak up against domestic abuse, uh, you're going to get a lot of pain and not believed. The abuse and trolling uh, that Amber Heard received as a result of that ca case was stunning. And just a few weeks later, we have Dobbs versus Jackson's Women Health. Dobbs versus Jackson's women health, women's health. Um, it was ruled by the judicial branch taking down Roe versus Wade.
So access to abortion was no longer guaranteed by the federal government. So a protection of human rights was removed for women. This occurred on, on 24th of June, 2022. Has anyone got any questions so far? Okay. Um, so a, a presentation was done August last year. From the time is now ministry. And in the that presentation, some arguments were laid out for these waymarks. And um, I'll give a summary of what I understand uh, what was presented. Um, forgive me um, if I uh, don't do a very good job. So what was laid out is there's an agitation of the Sunday law. Which occurs at 2021 and onwards. Um, and that agitation progressively increases. And what that means is there's something wrong in the United States. The public is becoming more and more aware that human rights are not being treated properly. And in some areas, human rights are actually reducing and under attack. Um, particular focus is human rights for women and LGBTQIA+. So these human rights issues are increasing in intensity. And it's these events that occur in the harvest of the Levites and the latter rain of the Nethanites. Testing. Okay. And if I was to say, if you cast your mind back over the past couple of years, what is the biggest event that demonstrates that the US is no longer on a path that protects human rights? can answer that if you like. Um, if I use movement language, what is the most significant event that agitates the gender-based Sunday law? I 
I've already put it on the board. Dobbs. Dobbs versus Jackson's women's health. Um, it is now visible. It's there for all to see. Now, simultaneously, leading up to this history, um, within the movement, we have some messages. So we have 20 VESPA studies. Um, those VESPA studies deal with so many topics. I'm sure you've all been reviewing them, as did everyone here, for quite some time. You know, top... Topics like understanding our worldviews and how and why we move from right wing to left wing. Uh, the underlying ethos that governs both sides, right wing and left wing. And how they prioritise and find either equality or freedom to be more important when they come into conflict. And we discussed many examples like Masterpiece Cake Shop, Masterpiece Cake Shop. And we even went back to the civil rights movement where the government removed government for segregation. But what really caused heartburn for a lot of right-wing people wasn't so much re removing the government for segregation It was the government introducing forced integration. And we talked about how that collided with people's freedom and they didn't like that. And so you'd end up with people like Bob Jones creating universities so they didn't have to follow that. We talked about Max as a case study. Um, brought us, and that brought us to the Trinity, which is atheism, men's rights, activism, and libertarianism. Uh, so we've got atheism, men's rights, activism, and libertarianism. So we broke down these subjects. Libertarianism from a personal level right through to a, a national level. and how a country operates with foreign policy. If a country practices libertarianism, that country becomes an instrument of aggression.
and attacks uh, and assists the abuser to attack the victim. Another topic, is it okay to intervene or not intervene? When a country commits human rights violations. Which brings us to sifting the left or the problems with the left. Far left, um, the far left see American imperialism as a great wrong. That, that, that intense focus can make them blind to human rights abuses. from regimes or authoritarian regimes who also see the threat as of American imperialism. Um, so those regime, authoritarianism, authoritarian regimes also see the threat of American imperialism. We learnt about neoconservatives and paleoconservatives. Remember, it's the paleos that bring in the Sunday law. But the paleoconservatives are the isolationists. The neoconservatives are the one that intervene. I'm just saying some of these things to tr trigger our memories of Vespers. So we looked at atheism. Remember, it's not just about church and state. It's embedded in culture. It's culture and state. Another topic that was quite profound. If we are in a political culture war where we vote for a side on earth, then the great controversy is also a political culture war where we vote. And it's about two ways of governing. The two ethos, freedom over equality and equality over freedom. Hu human rights are universal, not just a Western value that's spread. and many other topics. So the last Vespers, number 20, Elder Tess completed a summary of the entire Vespers. She demonstrated the progression of the Vespers and explained the themes of the Vespers. So that last comprehensive summary of the Vespers um, that last study was done on the 24th of June.
So one of the main themes or the story that was threaded through Vespers This isn't the only one, but it's a, one of the main ones. Is we were constantly trying to sift the left or trying to find the problems with the left. We did focus on the right quite a bit, but so we could understand better the left. So we could get a better understanding of the problems in the left wing side. So the summary focused on where the left is failing. And how and why they need sifting. Like they see racism where they should see sexism. And like I said before, the far left can be one dimensional. And see American imperialism as a great oppression. while the oppression of other human rights are not as treated as is important. Because they're looking through the lens of colonialism. So I guess internally we have a, a message summarising. Um, so internally we have a message summarising the Vespers and it's about sifting the left. And how the left is failing. And externally we have an event that demonstrates the left's failure. Most people will try and lay blame to the feet of the right wing. But we should know the fault lies at the feet of the left wing. they've become complacent and drop the ball. They've adopted liberal and cultural feminism in enough numbers that human rights of women are falling away before our eyes. Okay, so I'm going to, I'll stop there. Um, I'll stop there for time. Let's uh, join me in a word of prayer, please. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for the blessings of this weekend where we've where we've um, heard messages and uh, had conversations and um, had uh, a, a good and enjoyable time with each other. As this camp 
uh, comes to a close. We pray for a blessing on everyone here. And on everyone who is listening on Zoom. We thank you for your messages. We thank you for the methodology. And we're grateful that for these number of years now, you have opened our eyes. We leave ourselves in your care. In Jesus' name, amen.